All right, welcome everybody to the Future of Independence keynote session. We have Lior Cohen, Nadia Khan, and Emmanuel de Boretel, and we're, we're gonna be exploring the ins and outs of the independence sector and their thoughts for the future. I'd like to ask Lior to kick us off with some opening remarks. Over to you, Lior. Thank you, Edward, and hi, everybody. And it's so great to be here with everybody. And Paul, thank you so much for inviting me. When you called me a few years ago, it was immediate yes. Um, and I'm so happy that we found the time to finally do this. Boy, are we living in the most unprecedented times. Everything that we see, see in the world seems upside down, whether it's COVID or the conflict in the Middle East, um, the issues around Black Lives Matters, Asian hate, the transitions in governments. It's pretty amazing to be a citizen of the world and watch what's going on. I have to say my heart goes out to all of those that are being affected. It's, um, it's just uh, so upsetting right now what's happening around the world. You know, when I came to YouTube, I believed in its potential. I believed that it was um, part of shepherding, shepherding the golden age of music. Yesterday, we shared some growth stats, and I'm really proud of them. YouTube paid over $4 billion to the music industry in the last 12 months and has added more paid members in Q1 2021 than any other quarter since its launch. That's really, really big. Over the years, we built a world-class music team that ranges between engineers and music experts. Together, we work tirelessly to create meaningful growth in music. It's our honor and our privilege to be at your service. Our team wakes up every morning with a clear mission to help artists and songwriters make a living and amplify and celebrate diverse voices. We take this responsibility home every single night. It drives us to work harder, especially alongside you. Like I said, the world is upside down, but we feel that we're actually helping the world be a better place. And that's what inspires us. You know, in fact, June is Pride Month and Black Music Appreciation Month. And when I think about it, the breadth and the quality of the music that's coming into YouTube every day, the diversity amongst artists and songwriters that are coming to YouTube to engage with their fans, it's nothing short of an oh my God. I'm especially excited about the independent community. It's growing faster than ever. It's growing faster than ever. It's amplifying voices, minority voices all across the world and giving everybody a stage. Bravo to you guys. I so appreciate working with you all. It's just amazing to watch. The success of YouTube is really the twin engine growth story. We give users the choice to pay with their attention, or their wallets. We believe that our job is to meet the consumer where they are. In fact, last week I was at a road show with a label and one of the executives brought their nine and 11 year old um, to uh, 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 join the meeting because they were um, um, groupies of YouTube. When the kids left, I turned to the record executives and said, they're obviously important consumers. They don't have a job, so they're either riding your um, um, family plan or they're paying with their eyeballs. I can just tell you that we are the fastest growing subscription service out there. We know that those super lean, we know where the super lean then people that are paying with their eyeballs. We know where they are. That's why AVOD is so important. Not only do we um, advertise to them so we could 
um, earn our partners, you, money, but we also know when to shepherd them to a subscription service. I love our product and I hope that you use our product. It's the dopest product out there and I hope that you're using it. Of course, there's so many things that we need to get right, but those are two of the most important focused areas that I spend and my team spends an enormous amount of time on. Of the $4 billion plus generated for artists and songwriters and rights holders in the last 12 months, as you read, 30% of it has come from UGC. Fan-powered videos have always flourished on YouTube, helping artists grow their audiences and break songs all around the world. We're thrilled that it's becoming a meaningful and incremental source of revenue alongside your premium content. Being here is a huge opportunity for us to put some context around our overall music mission and to answer any questions that you may have. Independent artists and music entrepreneurs doing it on their own terms. Those are my type of people. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk with my friend, my long-standing friend, Emmanuel. What's up, Emmanuel? And it's great to meet you too, Nadia. Off to you, Edward. Thank you, Lior, for the intro. Uh, I think I'd love to hear from our other two guests as well. So over to you, Nadia. Like, we'd love to know how did you get started in the music industry and what can you share with our audience about um, independent entrepreneurship? Thank you, Edward. Um, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Nadia Khan. I am um, a music manager and consultant. I've been working in the industry for nearly 20 years. I've been a music manager for 16 years of that. I've um, you know, run independent record labels for my artists set up independent businesses and charted top 20 and top 10 records. Um, through that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, a really important record that kind of, I guess, changed my life and kind of got me into management in the first place. And um, that record is Pow Forward by Lethal Bizzle. Um, you know, it was around the time uh, in 2004 where there was a new genre kind of bubbling, uh, grime was kind of coming out. I was working in PR. That's how I kind of broke and got into the industry um, from like a work experience placement and was working in music PR, but I was living in East London at the time and I heard this song and it just blew me away. Um, you know, it was 10 different MCs from different crews all across London on a track together for the first time. And it was so exciting. Um, you know, I knew their lyrics from private radio sets, but here was a song with all the best known lyrics together on one track. And this was off the back of garage music being, you know, really stamped out, you know, the media had just blocked out. So Solid Crew, uh, Lethal Bizzle, who, who my, my artist that I manage, he had just come out of More Fire Crew where, you know, he was signed to a major, he was had a top 10 record, he was on top of the pops. And then when garage music was just completely blocked out, he just went to just completely being dropped and then just going back and having to start from scratch again. And he set up his own record label, Lethal Bizzle Records and, um, kind of, this was the first release, Power Forward. Um, and the energy of this track was just too much. So when I heard it, I had to work it. I tracked him down, you know, I was living in East London at the time, he's from East London. And I just um, spoke to him and told him I needed to work this record and I needed to work with him. And, and that's kind of how we met and obviously kind of worked together over the last 16 years, kind of building independent businesses and, and, and breaking through. And the interesting thing about that record as well, you know, again, following on from Garage being banned, Grime was banned from the UK. You know, the industry didn't want to hear about Grime. Um, you know, that record got banned from being played in clubs. There was even signs up in clubs across the, the UK saying, we do not play this record, do not request it. We don't even play the instrumental. And this was because the energy of the track was, was too much, you know, and I was doing press at the time and I was um, kind of, uh, you know, really highlighting the fact that this was just like, and mosh pits, it was just like mosh pits, but the energy was just too exciting that people got scared by it. And it subsequently led to him being banned from performing um, across the, the UK, you know, so, but that song couldn't be contained. You know, we ended up charting it number 11 in the Christmas week in 2004. And, you know, that record changed my life. It's what got me into management and it sparked a, like a fire in my belly, you know, like a, a hunger and passion for music. And I've 
believed in it. I wanted it to be successful and I wanted to fight against the, the nose. And if you look at the guys in the scene that are still around today, uh, you know, like Lethal Bizzle, Skepta, Getz, Giggs, Kano, just to name a few of those, you know, they've been doing this for over 10 years and all of them were blocked. All of them were stopped or had shows canceled at some point in their careers, but they kept going um, until they broke through. And it's that, that tenacity and self-belief that I love. And, you know, that's what inspires me in music. And I see so much of that in the independent community and that's what I love. And I think that's what inspires me to, to do what I do. Thank you. Amazing Thanks. story, amazing story. I remember in 1983 when um, I was the road manager of Run DMC and they only allowed us to play a marquee um, um, daytime show because they were so scared of us. It's just great story, Nadia. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I love the, the really the hustle and the resilience, right, that emanates from it. Like, I love to hear as well from Emmanuel. I know, I know a bit about your career, but I'd love for you to share with the audience because there's been a lot of resilience there as well and a lot of trajectory. Emmanuel, I think you may be on mute. Yeah, the concept of independent for me is, is first you have to be independent minded, you know, regarding music. But um, no, I start on very uh, boring way. You know, I was a young kid you know, who was in his engineering school, very bored, you know? And um, so I was booking shows and I was booking very young bands, you know, called U2, Cure, Shade, you know, the Pogs, you know, and uh, music became my passion more and more. But, um, but as, as I was very nice with my parents, you know, I got accepted to MIT. And so I had to go to, to Boston and do my engineering school and right after, you know, I decided not to f not to continue and and to join a very independent company at the time called Virgin. You know, and and I, I became a publisher. I became the head of Virgin Publishing in France, and I start to sign very original artists. It was the beginning of hip hop in France. You know, and we became very successful on the publishing side. And then I ran the record company, and then on the record company, I was very interested by all this new current in Europe, like electronic music and, and world music. And so I signed, you know, artists like uh, Daft Punk, Air, Phoenix, you know, Geta and Manu Chao. And, um, you know, I became the head of Virgin Europe. And I tried to, uh, at the same time as I was working on all the international Anglo-Saxon Virgin uh, priority, I was pushing a lot of uh, international act you know, from Europe, from continental Europe, you know, to, uh, to break worldwide and with quite a good success. But of course, you know, Virgin was an independent, but um, got bought by EMI. So I became the head of EMI Europe and, um, and things start to be more complicated. You know, when you work for an independent, you know, people trust your youth, people trust your, you know, your, your, your own decision, you know, Branson was quite cool on that. And, um, but when you work for a huge company, you know, you have new goals, you know, you have to deliver album for the budget and not album for the artist. You have to put anti-piracy stickers on a Daft Punk album. And it's very difficult to explain to the artist. So at the end, you know, and the situation was, I decided to leave and try to create what I thought will be the model of a music company for tomorrow. And um, I decided to take the name of a Beatles songs because that was the first song that my parents play when I was young. And I, this, it, it, it's because, you know, by, of course, Lennon and McCartney. And, and, um, and uh, it was free, by the way. But I, I so I got the because.com, but I call the company because.tv because image was like my main focus, you know? Most of my bands, you know, I remember when I did, uh, uh, when I released the first track of, of, of Daft Punk at Virgin, it was an instrumental track called Daft Punk. And the world was telling me, you know, you should not release a, 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 an instrumental track, it will never work, you know. But we managed to convince Spike Jones to do this crazy uh, video with the dog, you know, and, uh, and the song became a, a hit, even though there was no lyrics on it, you know. So, I was very uh, 
very into image. And of course, YouTube, you know, start and it was the logical uh, move for us to um, to try to experiment and work with YouTube a lot, you know. So uh, our company is is 100% independent today, is direct to uh, to DS to DSP. I try to be a technological artisan, what I call. So I don't want to sign a lot of artists. I want to sign a few artists and focus and being a total expert on all the fields. So my company today is able to produce a show. You know, we have. For, 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 for a production company to do live shows. We have a very strong publishing company. We publish from My Way to Daft Punk. Uh, and we have a, a strong record company. You know, we sign on Because, uh, Christine and the Queen, Major Laser, who reached 3 billion streams last week, you know, on YouTube. And, uh, and, and of course, some artists join me, uh, like Manu Chao or Pedro with his label Ed Banger. So it's a very exciting uh, little bubble, you know. You have some hits in there. I think Daft Punk is ranking almost at 5 million subscribers. And as you said, Major Laser joined the Billion Club a long time ago and is now leading with, with, with 3 billion. I yeah. think it's... And, and we just have office in, in a few territories. So we developed the way we work, you know, in England, where we signed Metronomy and now Shy Girl to the States, you know. So we, we are trying to be uh, worldwide. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks uh, for sharing that. I think it's important. Edward, yeah. I, would like to, I would like to ask Emmanuel. Emmanuel, when you're deciding to leave and start your own company, that must have been a really difficult decision or mm -hmm. maybe an easier, easy decision. But I know that you're one of the, um, you're like a music royalty and people really loved your work and you're breaking artists left and right. And I'm sure that they were going to pay you a, a, a ton of money to stay. How did you have the courage to leave and do your own thing? That's I'm curious about that. And I'm sure all the audience wants to know, where did you get the courage to do it on your own? You know, I will return the question because, you know, when you left Warner, you create 300, you know, how you got the courage to, you know, after being the boss of Warner worldwide to create 300. But, you know, you know, I, it was it was easy at the stage. It was easy at the stage because when I when I when I joined Virgin, you know, after being the head of publishing, you know, he, he let me build my own publishing company with EMI. You know, at the time, and uh, and I, and when I left, I sold it. So I had enough money in my plan to finance my own company without any pressure from the bank, any pressure from anyone, any deals to do with a major. You know, I had full freedom to uh, deliver the the vision I had at the time. So. I was not brave. I think it was the logic. It took me three months to start it after I left EMI. So answer I, me on 300. I, I, <clears throat> I relish in the friction. You know, people have this saying, if everything's working, don't fix it. When things are working, that's when I get nervous. I try to fix it then. Because if you try to fix it when it's not working, it's too late. So I actually thrive in the friction. Um, I feel the most comfortable um, when things are um, on the edge or close to the edge. I like putting things on the line. I like um, taking risks. It's not for everybody. Um, that's one of the things that I want to be, you know, communicate. Um, being in the music industry is really hard. We have all these images of uh, people living La Vida Loca and um, um, how wonderful, you know, uh, um, this business is. Um, but you really do have to have passion because there's so many lean times, scary times where no one's picking up the phone and, um, you just have to look yourself in the mirror and believe that you're really good and you continue to um, um, love the music business. Because at the end of the day, 
You may have no friends or associates, but you have the music and you have your artists and you have the dedication that it takes for you to keep moving. You know, I've had um, many times um, situations that I was down and out and saved by records. Like I can remember I signed one bad act after another. I was on a streak of every single bad act I signed. Remember the Afros and the family and all of that? One bad act after another. And I believe every act that I sign, I believe that um, they're going to change the world and alter my life. And um, so it's hard to accept. And the more you sign um, and the colder you get, most people um, actually um, work hard to kill themselves. But you actually... When you get in a cold phase, you have to actually breathe and, and, and float um, because you can't force getting hot after cold. And then time for some action, Red Man came along and all of a sudden, you know, I was back in play. I remember I got tossed out of Sony um, and um, I was in dire straits, and I had this little record called Regulate by Warren G. Um, that was incredible moment. Um, um, but there were lots of lean moments. But, you know, sometimes because you're so passionate at what you do, you don't even recognize how lean they are. Um, and, sure. and, yeah. Thank you. I, I'm sure there's something a lot, a lot of people in the audience can relate. There's ups and downs. I think I love to focus on on the trend we've been seeing with independent music really like growing and exploding in in many parts of the world and across platforms. I think a lot of what 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 you have shared has to do with that perseverance and that resilience. Love to hear from Nadia. And what do you think are the factors that are triggering this growth? And do you think this growth is sustainable? Um, over to you. Cool, thank you. Great stories. Uh, great to hear your story, Lior and Emmanuel as well. Loving it. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we have to think about how we release music has kind of changed dramatically over the last five to six years. You know, um, in some ways, we really had to think, rethink everything from scratch of like how we build campaigns with the kind of advent of streaming. I remember being in, in one of the majors when streaming had just kind of been introduced and asking around the building and everyone was just like we don't know what to do we're having to relearn everything of our whole strategy of how we release kind of records and you know you're looking at the number of records that are getting released daily you know you're in the tens of thousands that are getting uploaded daily um so that growth has come from you know the accessibility to distribution platforms and more and more diy releases and everyone and anyone can upload music um, but I think the challenges that uh, new business entrepreneurs nowadays are facing is like how to stand out and be heard in a competitive market. And it's kind of different to how when I started out, you know, it was more about those gatekeepers kind of having to break through that. But now everyone uh, can do it. So the kind of challenges have kind of flipped. Um, and I know a lot of people are like exploring, you know, new dynamic business models um, and actually looking at maybe membership and subscription models like Patreon, for an example, or direct to fan uh, sales driven models, live streaming, building their own mini sites. And I think also interestingly, like going back to physical products, you know, introducing vinyl and uh and CDs and, and cassettes and kind of making a more unique kind of special experience with fans. Um, and I also think another big challenge um, for kind of uh, independent businesses now is kind of growing sustainable independent businesses um, uh, and, and making money in this current market. Um, so it's all about like tapping into those additional income streams and really diversifying like the ways in which you release music. And um, I think, you know, We've adapted and changed so much and will continue to adapt and evolve over the years. But I think the future is really exciting. There's lots of new technology coming through. I think new technology will, will keep coming through and will keep changing how we interact with fans and how we sell music and merch and, and tickets. And one other thing I wanted to say was also that, you know, I think that um, Leo touched on it at the beginning was that 
you know, lockdown and, and COVID, has, has, we've all been through a really, really tough period over the last year and a half. And I think it's really shown how resilient and adaptable the independent community are. Uh, I've seen so many adapt and thrive in these really difficult circumstances. So, you know, that gives me a hope and, and reassurance that definitely, you know, we're going to sustain it for the future, for sure. Nadia, I want, I want to comment. Sorry, Edward. Um, I really can't stand a record company when an act comes in and the first question they ask is how many followers you have. Um, I want to say the best way of cutting through the clutter is having the dopest music out there. And, you know, there's too, too much focus on the um, go to market and I think less focus on um, incredible music, um, um, music that just changes the world and makes you say, oh my God. And then all of a sudden people are p passing and sharing it. Emmanuel has been a, a huge part of that. He focuses on the music and getting the music right. And I think that's really one of the things that I want to encourage all the um, people listening is the lost art is artist development and A&R. Okay. You have, you have incredible music and you um, have an artist that understands the development process and can, can collaborate with passionate people like Nadia. Nadia, you will find, if you found, um, the next uh, Tupac, and he didn't have one follower, you would find him a market. And I think artists are confused, like, should I be a social media person or should I be a musician? And I encourage um, 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 musicianship and the truth over um, social media um, bullshit. I, I what do you make of that, Emmanuel? Yeah, I can add something. On, you know, I think the DSP, you know, and 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 YouTube was a, a main actor to help a lot by coming. They were media also. You know, they will not accept to be a media, but they will be a media. You know, the the the, the world in music was quite mature when the DSP came. And uh, radio were playing a certain kind of music, but there was a lot of music which was not played. You know, they had no access. You know, I want to talk, for example, about hip hop in Europe. You know, hip hop in Europe was very, very lightly played. You know, you got in France, we got lucky because we got a big uh, radio, uh, hip hop radio called Skyrock. But, but in most of European territories, hip hop was a second genre, it was like a beam, like B movies, you know, nobody cares. And, uh, and the DSPs and YouTube in particular really help, you know, to achieve a, a, a development of all these, I will say, uh, uh, badly treated genre and movement. You know, I want to talk about, you know, local hip hop. I want to talk about reggaeton. I want to talk about Latin music, you know, in the rest of the world. I want to talk about the Nigerian wave we, we're living right now, or the South African wave we're going to live next year. You know, there is so, re you know, we, we were in a very Anglo-Saxon world in terms of music. You know, it was music from the States or music from England, but now it's music from the world and not world music, you know. So I think the DSP, you know, really help, you know, to uh, open doors and windows for all these genres of music who are now, you know, have achieved their, their full audience. You know, today, uh, uh, a German or French hip hop track can do 300 million streams in his own territory. You know, it's six or seven times more than any international artist, you know, and some, and now some of this hip hop act, you know, from the UK or from, of, 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 from uh, 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 Algeria or Morocco start to export all over the world and be listened by a huge worldwide community. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very positive. I think it's very good for, for the world. And, uh, and I think it has been very important, you know, to, uh, 
to have this DSP at this time, you know, to, to have people much more open to music. The millennium generation doesn't care about, you know, genre, they care about music. You know, they can listen to a, 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 a kind of a Georgia Smith track and then listen to an Electrologic 1000 and then listen to a, a, a Frank Ocean track. You know, there is no, there is no frontier or barrier. And, um, and I think this, I think a, one of the key driver, I think, you know? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of international sounds that are flaring in specific platforms before they go mainstream. I think Nadia mentioned um, um, a few, uh, um, a few memories from from early days uh, with the grime community, and I think there's a lot in that as well. Like, if you care to elaborate on the role platforms played and like how video, I, I think was crucial. I was working in the UK at the moment, and I remember like grime artists were releasing video before they were releasing songs, making their distribution partners go crazy sometimes. So I'd love to hear some stories for the audience. Yeah, sure. No, I think you know it was you know the growth of like accessible technology and you know that's where i saw uh, lethal bizzles forward i saw it on channel u i saw the video first and that you know that's how they were promoting their music at the time because there wasn't many outlets or there wasn't any outlets you could count on you know your your, your fingers and then i think you know the advent of youtube and cheaper technology allowing everyone and anyone to be able to become a content content creator and as we went on you know smartphones everyone has that technology now in their hands and um, what was really exciting was everyone was making their their own videos, up, uploading them, getting them out there, and this really kind of built the scene. And it was very visually led, um, and that was when this, the platforms that are huge now, like GRM Daily, Link Up TV, SBTV, you know, that's when they kind of set up their YouTube channels, and that was a really exciting and pivotal moment. And that's when things started to change in um, the industry, and definitely the direction for Black music within the UK music industry, because the fans now were in charge and they could decide what they wanted to watch. They could decide what was hot. Um, so that was really powerful for genres like grime and drill, which have been kind of, you know, gone through being banned in the industry as well. And, you know, I think that was a game changer. And, um, you know, not having support on radio, we don't need it. You know, we can we can get the views and we can get out to fans directly. So um, like uh, Lior said as well, you know, it frustrates me and so many in the community with um, just, you know, how uh, labels and a &R sign music now. They want you to do all the uh, groundwork, you know, yourself, and they look to those platforms and kind of see who's already popping and who's already getting those those views. You have to kind of build that hype up um, yourself. And it, it, you're right, it shouldn't be about those, um, those numbers. There should be just that real passion to kind of find um, key talent. But obviously, there's an incredible breadth of amazing boutique and uh, independent labels that are really passionate about specific genres and go out and, and, and find them. So yeah, that's been a, a real incredible journey for me to see. Very cool. Anything to add from the platform side, Lior? Like how are independent artists making it on YouTube? How are we leaning on the platform? How are they leaning on the products? So independent artists, independent labels are exploding on the platform. Their Kager is the highest growth of any category. Um, and the thing that makes me the most excited about it is the fact that leadership is starting to see this trend and build them much better products that help them remain independent, thrive independent, grow independent, um, and uh, maybe you could tell them about some of the new products that we're building, um, Edward. Well, I'd love to hear as well from the rest, but I think, um, you know, it's, there's definitely been uh, a jump from, from having artists dial into YouTube and upload content the same way non-music creators were to really creating this official artist channel format that aggregates the presence of, of an artist on the platform. Artists can see their analytics. They can understand how their music is being used in user content. They can see how um, their official music videos are doing. They can understand how curator channels like the ones Nadia was mentioning, LinkUp TV, 
Jamal's SBTV, how are they featuring their content and how that's um, having an impact on their official views. So I think there's definitely a lot of um, artist facing products that we've rolled out in the last in the last five years. And then look, there's also admin on YouTube, right? There's like content ID, there's delivery of audio for YouTube music. And we understand that art is one optionality. In fact, we're, we're rolling out preferred distribution program to make sure that people partner with the right distributors and that um, we put all the right checks in place um, to elevate the good actors and to make sure we're fostering a healthy ecosystem. But there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of investment on products that are that are targeted to the artists. I think there's um, there's been a, a whole lot of innovation. It's it's making it hard to follow. I'm sure. I mean, I don't know if you have some some experiences from dealing with some of these products and and running campaigns on uh, the platform with the artists. I can talk about some frustration that the independents have right now. You know, the, the, some of the frustration the independent have right now is with all the DSPs, and then I'll come back to YouTube. But the little frustration that all the independents have is that they create this uh, with the DSP or the social network. They create this uh, fan base, you know, and uh, and uh, and uh, these five base grow, but when they want to use it, you know, either they have to pay for it, either they lose a part of it, they have no control for it. I think YouTube is interesting for, for that with community because there is not these kind of bargaining tools than other, you know, big platform have, you know, it's much more, it's free, you know, so you don't have to pay to reach your audience. But I think it's important that uh, YouTube, uh, 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 you know, stay a leader in that you know i think it's it's not acceptable that you have to pay to reach your audience you know i think it's it's a partnership between the artist the indie, indie label and the platform and i think community is much better tool and um i will say if i have to give an advice to youtube there should be more ergonomy for independent label for understand more even doing macros for them to read the analytics better I know it's a difficult process and you already deliver a lot of information, but improving this macro, it's very important. And I want to come back also on another point is, you know, as I described, you know, a lot of genre, you know, have, have, have been exploding and mature because of, of YouTube, but YouTube has to keep the fact that they have to help all the genre, you know, the, the, I will call it the exponentialization of the audience, you know, through the algorithm. Have a chance to put the, the fan into a bubble where the diversity is difficult to reach. They should be able to go somewhere else without, be, without being guided, you know? And I, uh, I agree that was with my, you. That was my little question to, uh, my little difficult question to my friend Lior. He say, how I'm can happy to answer it. I'm how happy can, to answer. How can the YouTube algorithm can preserve diversity? You know, diversity is almost in the DNA of, of all independence, you know, and, and how can also uh, uh, avoid the bubble phenomenon? You know, you don't want to listen to what you like. You want to discover, you know, and I think we need filters. We need more filters. Music is changing the millennium like everything. We need filters and... Um, you know, we have things like colors, for example, which is a good example on YouTube. But, um, but um, yeah. I'm very passionate about this, Emmanuel. I'm as passionate about this as you are. And here's how I describe it to the engineers and the people who um, control the algorithm. Years ago, when I went to buy a record, I was focused on buying a Tribe Called Quest record. And I went into the record store and I grabbed the Tribe Called Quest and I started moving towards the um, cash register. And as someone said, I see you have a Tribe Called Quest album there. Have you ever considered this De La Soul album? And I said, hmm, let me take it. That night, what blew my mind was De La Soul, not Tribe Called Quest, because I knew because I made a determination that Tribe Called Quest was special to me. But what really blew my mind and what made me sticky to that um, um, record store 
was the surprise and delight of the De La Soul album. And so what I've told the people who um, are in control of the algorithm, it may be a short-term investment for the long term, because I believe someone who gets delighted and surprised and um, um, isn't in the echo chamber and the bubble is a much better customer over the long haul. And that's what I'm working on. So Emmanuel and everybody, you're seeing the 2.3.0 version of the algorithm that will get smarter, um, more efficient, and better for everybody, including music discovery. Wonderful. I think, I think this is, I mean, it's so great to hear you interact and see that, that there's different takes on how things work, but that at the end, like we're in a partnership with the industry and that we will listen. I'd love to hear back from Nadia more on a granular level. Like we have a very hands-on audience, managers that are looking for artists to, to, to work with and producers, like what are the top tips that you would share with them based on everything we've discussed? Like, what, what is there to look out to, to, to make the right connections and the, the right business partnerships? Yeah, I think that's a question that comes up a lot. And obviously with the audience, you know, a lot of them are kind of going to be like emerging managers and kind of starting creating their businesses. And there's so much choice out there. And one thing I say to everybody is just really take your time before you build those partners and relationships. You want to build the right label around you. And we've all spoken about it and touched on it. It's about uh, building passionate teams behind you um, and just choosing people to work in your team that are bringing something to the table that have that passion. They understand your um, direction and where you want to go because, um, you know, we're talking about putting music out in that competitive market and going back to it, you know, this is why we're all doing it because we, we love music and, um, you know, that's what drives us in the first place and, and building dynamic, exciting, passionate teams um, that kind of creatively come up with some really unique ideas to market your projects and, and get it out there and can fight with you and go along that journey through the peaks and the troughs and kind of gonna, gonna, gonna stick with you um, is what's really kind of essential, I think, to kind of building those long-term careers and just um, educating yourself and getting that knowledge and not being afraid to, to ask questions um, when you know making those decisions because they're they're really important. Lovely. Anything to add, Emmanuel? I know you partner with artists in many different capacities. Like you run a festival, you you've been working um, on the publishing side and the record side. Like, how do you how do you decide who to partner with today versus five years ago? Building on what Nadia shared. And you're on mute. Sorry. I'm, I mainly sign artist, singer, songwriter with a great character, you know, Christine the Queen or, or even Justice or, or fantastic individual, very smart people. But, but I, I, I want, I, so I, I, I'm interested by this character. And so the choice is very subjective, you know, and, and should stay subjective based on passion. But I, I want to give some advice to a, a small label or to, a, to an artist who wants to be alone, uh, who wants to, try to, uh, you know, to, to exist. Uh, you know, it's very difficult today. You have a, a lot of choice. You have plenty of options you didn't have before, but you are in a, in a notion of millions of track. And today, the very important thing is, is the attention, you know? So, so it's why I, I call because a technological artisan, because, you know, today, the time, the planning, you know, it's very important. Everything is immediate. Your reaction, you need to have all the information system to be able to react quickly, you know? And, uh, and so it's a kind of a global team, global mind. And it's, like, it's why I like small teams, like commando teams. So for any deal, it's important, but you have to choose, you know, if you go to TuneCore or if you go to a, 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 an aggregator or if you go to a, to a, an artist service, or if you go to a label like Vegas or Domino, or if you go to a to a major label, it's a choice. But you know, as as a, as Nadia said, you know, you need to have the team. You know, you need to have a team of expertise, and you need to create around you a team of expertise. You know, you can use 
all kinds of options, but at the end, it, sh it should be a team of experts. And the common denominator of all these teams is to be passionate about your music. Great, great. I think um, I think the most beautiful part of the transformation is that there's a lot more diversity in the teams that are being put together, and there's no one size fits all. And artists are having a big a big say on that. Um, I've been screening the comments, and we have some audience members from Nigeria. I think uh, we talked about the explosion of African music. I know both. Uh, in fact, all of you are very close to to Africa as a as a continent. So I love I love to go back to that and try and better understand what's happening. How can we learn from it? And like, what are the tips we give to artists, producers, and music makers in the continent? I'll take a shot of it. Um, first of all, the melodies coming out of Africa is just on another level just on another level. Here's the problem. The problem is that the artists um, work so hard to become popular and they became popular in Africa, primarily West Africa, that, and they've invested so much effort in that, that when it's time to go outside of Africa where they aren't known and they go from playing many thousands of people to building from scratch, they don't want to make the investment. And that's the gating problem there. You have to come out of Africa. You have to go to, um, 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 to the uh, um, beachhead in the diaspora, Houston, Atlanta, London, Paris, um, and Atlanta and Beachhead there. Um, look at the Koreans. The Koreans weren't satisfied with being big in Korea. They wanted to conquer globally. And when they sent the whistle out to Koreans all around the world, they showed up. And when they showed up at that moment, they triggered the algorithm and that's how they started dominating um, and becoming big. So my suggestion is come out of Africa and invest in your career outside of Africa. Anything to add there, Emmanuel, Nadia? No, I just say the first act I signed to Biko's music like 15 years ago was two, two blind Malian. 50 years old and I remember the major company I just left say Emmanuel is finished he just he just signed two old 50 years old blind people and um, we sold a million album of Amadou and Mariam you know with beautiful melodies and gorgeous great gorgeous I love it I mean you need to trust you need to trust your gut and you need to listen to the music right I think that's that's a big one we have two more minutes. I'd love to get final thoughts of advice for the audience. Like we have a lot of people life that are really trying to make it. Nadia, back to you, like very quick, short pieces of advice. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, just follow your passions and do what you love um, and don't let anyone tell you no and really believe in yourself and enjoy the journey. You know, we've talked about it being a roller coaster kind of journey, but it, I look back on those early days when I was really struggling and couldn't afford to get on the bus or couldn't pay my electric bill. And those are the best times of my career because, you know, you're overcoming those challenges and, and doing something you love, you're never going to feel like you, you know, you work a day in your life. So just follow your passions. I just think it's the most rewarding thing um, ever that you can do. But yeah, that's it from me. Thank you. Emmanuel? No, I just want to say, listen to Shy Girl. <laughs> <laughs> 14,000 14, people who listen to Shy Girl tonight is good for my, for my beautiful for business. But for the business? And for the business, I, you know me, I'm excited because the business is changing every time. And every time, if somebody say, you know, you find another, another technological solution. And it's why I love my job right now, because I'm mixing my engineering job with my creative job. And I love it, you know, and uh, 
it's it's super exciting you know and i know youtube you look like a a big uh, a big elephant and you know who break glasses but but we need you and we need you to be closer to us and uh, we of course we need you to be more generous with us especially the indie but uh, but uh, i think you're very you're very healthy it's very healthy for music you know so don't don't stop thinking about diversity of course we're here to talk and we're here to 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 listen as well lior we have 10 seconds any final remark yes my my advice is put it on the line just rip the rear view mirror off and throw it out the window the worst thing that you could do is could have would have should have put it on the line like nadia said have fun with it um and i do want to say i'm humbled to be able to do this with you nadia and emmanuel music royalty you guys are amazing and uh, edward thank you for um keeping the drum beat of the independence alive and let's go get it thank you everyone thank you everybody for listening and i think we got a bit of everything uh time to wrap